that we ought carefully to preserve ourselves from pleasures arising from bad music, and how it may be done. By Plutarch. Translated by William Watson Goodwin. Published in his Translation of the Moralia, 1878. That we ought carefully to preserve ourselves from pleasures arising from bad music and how it may be done. Callistratus Lamprius. At the Pythian Games, Callistratus, the procurator of the Amphictyons, forbade a piper, his citizen and friend, who did not give in his name in due time, to appear in the solemnity, which he did according to the law. But afterwards, entertaining us, he brought him into the room with the chorus, finely dressed in his robes and with chaplets on his head, as if he was to contend for the prize. And at first, indeed, he played a very fine tune. But afterwards, having tickled and sounded the humor of the whole company, and found that most were inclined to pleasure, and would suffer him to play what effeminate and lascivious tunes he pleased, throwing aside all modesty, he showed that music was more intoxicating than wine, to those that wantonly and unskillfully used it. For they were not content to sit still and applaud and clap, but many at last leaped from their seats, danced lasciviously, and made such gentle steps as become such effeminate and mollifying tunes. But after they had done, and the company, as it were, recovered of its madness, began to come to itself again. Lamprius would have spoken to and severely chided the young men, but as he feared he should be too harsh and give offense, Callistratus gave him a hint, and drew him on by this discourse. For my part, I absolve all lovers of shows and music from intemperance, yet I cannot altogether agree with Aristoxenus, who says that those pleasures alone deserve the approbation, fine. For we call viands and ointments fine, and we say we have finely dined, when we have been splendidly entertained. Nor, in my opinion, doth Aristotle upon good reason free those complacencies we take in the shows and songs from the charge of intemperance, saying that those belong peculiarly to man, and of other pleasures beasts have a share. For I am certain that a great many irrational creatures are delighted with music, as deer with pipes, and to mares, whilst they are horsing. They play a tune called Ipolos, and Pindar says that his songs make him move, as brisk as dolphins, whom a charming tune hath raised from the bottom of the quiet flood. And certain fish are caught by means of dancing, for during the dance they lift up their heads above water, being much pleased and delighted with the sight, and twisting their backs this way and that way, in imitation of the dancers. Therefore I see nothing peculiar in those pleasures, that they should be accounted proper to the mind, and all others to belong to the body, so far as to end there. But music, rhythm, dancing, song, passing through the sense, fix a pleasure and titillation in the sportive part of the soul, and therefore none of these pleasures is enjoyed in secret, nor wants darkness nor walls about it, according to the woman's phrase, but circuses and theatres are built for them. And to frequent shows and music meetings with company is both more delightful and more genteel, because we take a great many witnesses, not of a loose and intemperate, but of a pleasant and genteel manner of passing away our time. Upon this discourse of Callistratus, my father Lamprius, seeing the musicians grow bolder, said, That is not the reason, sir. And in my opinion, the ancients were much out when they named Dionysus the son of forgetfulness. They ought to have called him his father, for it seems he hath made you forget that some of those faults which are committed about pleasures proceed from a loose and temperate inclination, and others from heedlessness or ignorance. Where the ill effect is very plain, their intemperate inclination captivates reason and forces men to sin. But where the just reward of intemperance is not directly and presently inflicted, their ignorance of the danger and heedlessness make men easily wrought on and secure. Therefore, those that are vicious, either in eating, drinking, or venery, which diseases, wasting of estates, and evil reports usually attend, we call intemperate. For instance, 
Theodectes, who, having sore eyes, when his mistress came to see him, and said, All hail, delightful light, or Anaxarchus the Abderite, a wretch who knew what mischiefs weighed on sin, yet love of pleasure forced him back on. Once almost free, he sank again to vice, that terror and disturber of the wise. Now those that take all care possible to secure themselves from all those pleasures that assault them either at the smelling, touch, or taste are often surprised by those that make their treacherous approaches either at the eye or the ear. But such, though as much led away as the others, we do not in like manner call loose and intemperate, since they are debauched through ignorance and want of experience. For they imagine they are far from being slaves to pleasure, if they can stay all day in the theater without meat or drink, as if a pot forsooth should be mighty proud that a man cannot take it up by the bottom or the belly and carry it away, though he can easily do it by the ears. Therefore, I guess a louse said, it was all one whether a man were a canadus before or behind. We ought principally to dread those softening delights that please and tickle through the eyes and ears, and not think that city not taken, which hath all its other gates secured by bars, portcullises, and chains, if the enemies are already through one and have taken possession, or fancy ourselves invincible against the assaults of pleasure, because stews will not provoke us when the music meeting or theater prevails. For in one case, as much as the other, we resign up our souls to the impetuousness of pleasures, which, pouring in those potions of songs, cadences, and tunes, more powerful and bewitching than the best mixtures of the skillful cook or perfumer, conquer and corrupt us. And in the meantime, by our own confession, as it were, the fault is chiefly ours. Now, as Pindar says, nothing that the earth and sea has provided for our tables can be justly blamed. Nor doth it change, but neither our meat nor broth, nor this excellent wine which we drink, hath raised such a noisy tumultuous pleasure as those songs and tunes did, which not only filled a house with clapping and shouting, but perhaps the whole town. Therefore, we ought principally to secure ourselves against such delights, because they are more powerful than others, as not being terminated in the body, like those which allure the touch, taste, or smelling, but affecting the very intellectual and judging faculties. Besides, from most other delights, though reason doth not free us, yet other passions very commonly divert us. Sparing niggardliness will keep a glutton from dainty fish, and covetousness will confine a lecher from a costly whore. As in one of Menander's plays, where every one of the company was to be enticed by the bod who brought out a surprising whore, each of them, though all boon companions, sat sullenly and fed upon his cates. For to pay interest for money is a severe punishment that follows intemperance, and to open our purses is no easy matter. But these pleasures that are called genteel and solicit the ears or eyes of those that are frantic after shows and music may be had without any charge at all, in every place almost, and upon every occasion. They may be enjoyed at the prizes, in the theatre, or at entertainments, at others' costs. And therefore, those that have not their reason to assist and guide them may be easily spoiled. Silence following upon this, what application, said I, shall reason make, or how shall it assist? For I do not think it will apply those ear covers of Xenocrates, or force us to rise from the table as soon as we hear a harp struck or a pipe blown. No, indeed, replied Lamprius, but as soon as we meet with the aforesaid intoxications, we ought to make our application to the muses and fly to the helicon of the ancients. To him that loves a costly strumpet, we cannot bring a Panthea or Penelope for cure. But one that delights in mimics and buffoons, loose odes or debauched songs, we can bring to Euripides, Pindar, and Menander, that he might wash, as Plato phrases it, his salt hearing with fresh reason, as the exorcists command the possessed to read over and pronounce Ephesian letters, so we in those possessions, amid all the madness of music and dancing, when we toss our hands with noise and madly shout, 
remembering those venerable and sacred writings and comparing with them those odes, poems, and vain empty compositions shall not be altogether cheated by them or permit ourselves to be carried away sidelong as by a smooth and undisturbed stream. End of That we ought carefully to preserve ourselves from pleasures arising from bad music and how it may be done. From the Moralia, translated by William Watson Goodwin.